So it's my great pleasure today to introduce Megan Jones. Um, Megan got her Bachelor's of Science at Humboldt State University, where she graduated magna cum laude. And uh, in graduate school, as in the rest of life, Megan's time has been marked by a lot of adventure and travel. So before graduate school, she did things like study parrots in Ecuador, work with projects on tundra breeding birds in Alaska, greater sage grouse in Wyoming, brown tree creepers in Australia, and uh, actually did a project uh, helping out with the white ruffed mannequins that became the subject of her dissertation research. In graduate school, she continued her predilection for travel and adventure, spending lots of time in Panama and in Costa Rica, working under some really challenging conditions. Um, she also took the opportunity to take a course with the Organization for Tropical Studies in 2011. And she supported this uh, adventure and travel and this uh, very in-depth independent project by being very successful in seeking out independent funding for this work. So in her first year in graduate school, she applied for and received a graduate research fellowship that was an integral part of having the freedom to, to pursue this independent work. She also got an NSF graduate school dissertation research grant. She received a Lofton Award from our department. Um, she received national awards from uh, the American Ornithologist Union and Animal Behavior Society and a National Science Foundation dissertation improvement grant um, to support the end of her work. And one thing that I think you all already know about Megan is that she has kind of an extreme passion for science education that started very early in life. She actually grew up on a field station in Fossil, Oregon, where her parents ran uh, residential camps for the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. And so science teaching comes naturally to her, and it's one of those things that she kind of can't stop doing. So she's given public lectures not only on mannequin behavior, but also on things like entomophagy and teaching eighth graders how to bird effectively. And, um, and, and it's something that sort of perfuses her life in general. Um, this is something that's also been important for her work because her, her work was conducted at an ecotourism lodge in Costa Rica where she would come in exhausted from the field every day and then explain everything about mannequins and her research and her goals to an array of uh, tourists from around the world pretty much every night. <laughs> um, and so concurrent with her PhD, maybe it's no surprise that she also got a master's in science teaching um, during which she worked as an adjunct faculty member at Tallahassee Community College and she completed her PhD while working full-time as a science educator at NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network, where she's been a staff, a staff scientist and educator since 2015. So in my interactions with Megan, from the field to campus, um, she has, without fail, been the sort of person who is eager and, uh, and, and really willing to help anybody in any sort of situation. She gets the job done, she logically breaks down whatever problem you've encountered and helps you get it all taken care of. And so in ways big and little, intellectual and personal, it's been a real pleasure to have her as a member of our department and of my lab. And so I'm proud to share her work with you today. in a system where there's variation in the degree of cooperation between individuals. So when I say cooperation, you might be thinking of different types of cooperation. It's a term we use a lot in everyday society. Everything from the gene level to up to multicellular organisms can cooperate. And throughout this talk, when I say cooperation, I'm really <coughs> talking about cooperation where the cooperator is a selfish repl replicator that foregoes some of the reproductive potential to help someone else. And so that's the form of cooperation we're going to be talking about. We see cooperation in animal behavior in a lot of different contexts. So we can see it from cooperative hunting in chimpanzees, cooperative vigilance behavior in a breeding context. There's a lot of different species that have cooperative breeding, particularly in different species of birds. Um, and also in the reproductive context, but outside of the care of offspring, we see cooperation in the display behaviors, primarily between different males. So in order to understand the evolution of cooperation, I think it's very important that we look at this question from two different sides. Um, throughout you know, several centuries, actually, uh, scientists have been interested in the understanding of cooperation because it has an apparent contradiction 
to the to our understanding of evolution through natural selection. Um, and so a lot of that contradiction comes from the helper's side. Why is this individual giving up some of their own reproductive success in their help of another individual? And so why does the donor help? What are the benefits gained through the cooperation? And there's a lot of really excellent work asking this question. I'm gonna go through two different kind of case studies. Uh, the first one here with pied kingfishers. So this is a system where there are uh, male helpers at the nest. These helpers are feeding the nestlings and helping to defend the nest. Um, and there's two different types of helpers. There's primary helpers, and they are related to the breeding pair, so often offspring from a previous nesting attempt. And there are also secondary helpers who are males that are unrelated to the breeding pair. And so as you can expect, there are potentially some differences in why these helpers are helping, whether they're related or unrelated. And so basically, for the related helpers, it comes down to the fact of indirect benefits. So they're related and they're getting some indirect fitness benefits through the investing in offspring. For secondary helpers who are unrelated, indirect benefits do not apply. And really, they are primarily spending time feeding the female, and they're investing in future reproductive success through potentially a uh, potential mate in the future. If we look at another example with wild turkeys, Alan Krakauer's work, um, here, this is a system where it's cooperative male display. There's a dominant male and then subordinate males that they display with. And in this case, this is also explained through indirect fitness benefits. Um, with the subordinate male, with the subordinate males being related to the dominant individuals, and therefore there's fitness benefits for those subordinate individuals in this cooperative display. But while we the, the donor's perspective is very intriguing and is a apparent contradiction to our understanding of evolution through natural selection. It's also important to look at the uh, recipient's perspective. So this is a partnership that involves at least two individuals, the donor and the recipient. So why is the recipient tolerating this helper? So even in the language that I'm using today and that we often use in our writing, it's assumed that there's a, a help that this helper is giving. And so what are those benefits that are gained from cooperation? But this is also another individual that's in the area that could potentially be a competitor or there could other be some other cost to cooperation. So going back to these two different case studies in the Pied Kingfisher, the, particularly the secondary males are potential competitors for the breeding male, for that breeding female. And so we see that in cases where there is easy foraging and the breeding pair themselves can actually feed the and provision the young sufficiently. There's aggressive interactions with helpers, particularly the secondary helpers. Um, but when there is difficult foraging the, and the breeding pair cannot provide enough food for the offspring, we see a decrease in the aggression towards secondary helpers and that dominant individuals are benefiting from having helpers around because they can put the young get more food and therefore have higher survival. If we look at the, the turkey example, so this is a system where there's dominant individuals who are cooperating with subordinate individuals, but there are also males who are solo and not cooperating. And you see that the dominant males have higher reproductive success, whether it's the number of matings or the actual number of offspring than the solo males have. So in this case, through cooperation, the dominant males are actually increasing the reproductive success. So thinking about both the subordinate perspective and then also the dominant perspective or the why is the, the recipient receiving help, I'm particularly interested in asking questions about that second perspective. So why do the dominant individuals cooperate? And particularly, what are the fitness consequences related to cooperation for the dominant individuals in this system? So I addressed this question in the Pipridae family. So these are the neotropical mannequins. Um, there are about 50 species that are spread out through the New World tropics, and they are all lecking species. So the lek is an area that males congregate. They're displaying. Females go around and observe different males and choose which male they want to mate with. So it's a female mate-driven system, or a female choice-driven system, I should say. So within the phylogeny, they are all lecking, as I said, but we see some differences in how, how coordinated or cooperative the species is. So the most common is just solo displays, a classic lek. 
um, shown in blue, but we also see some degree of co coordination in the displays between males at the same lek in some of the species shown in green. And then there are a few species in orange which have been described as being both coordinated and cooperative in their displays with each other. So I'm particularly interested in understanding more about this in one particular species. So as a family, as a whole, Hippridae has been of interest to scientists because it allows the spectrum to ask questions about cooperation, how cooperation functions, and how cooperation may have evolved across a range of closely related species. Um, in the white rock mannequin, as I will show you in just a bit, we actually see this range from solo males to coordinated males within a single population at a single site. So I can ask questions about this range of cooperative behaviors and costs and benefits of the coordinated display or cooperative display for dominant individuals within a single species instead of doing interspecies comparisons. So the white rock mannequin is a small bird in the Neotropics. Um, it lives in pre-montane forests, so low mid elevation. Uh, they are altitudinal migrants that are also frugivorous. White earth mannequins have age-specific plumages, so young males and females look about the same. Third-year males get the Zorro mask, and the adult males are definitively plumaged. So one of the advantages to this is it means that we can specifically age males that are initially captured in these younger plumages, and in the definitively plumaged males, we know their minimum age if we capture them that stage. Uh, throughout the rest of the talk, when I say male mannequin, I'm really meaning adult males. It's where I focus my work on. There's some cool stuff going on with the young males, but that's not what I focused on for my PhD. So the display behavior of the white rock mannequins, they are dispersed lek. So this is a slightly more larger spatial area than the classic lek. Mm -hmm. The birds are displaying usually within auditory distance of each other, but not necessarily visual distance of each other. The displays are centered along a moss-covered log that's horizontal or near horizontal on the forest floor. Uh, and they, the physical and vocal courtship behaviors are centered or in the area around this log or actually on the log itself. So this species has been, there have been the descriptions of the display behavior for quite a while, and there's some variation in what was described. So the initial description only mentions solo displays by males, so a kind of classic lek, one male doing his display, females come up and watching it. There have been eight different previous mentions that I could find, um, and as you get closer to now, there have been other mentions of having multiple males that were at an area, but they never shared a space. We can talk about what that means later if you want to. Um, but there's also the most recent description prior to my work uh, described having multiple males, but said that there was no coordination in the displays, even if there are multiple males at the site. So I initially started this work as a field assistant for Alice Boyle's work on altitudinal migration in 2008, and this is what we saw and what I expected to see based on those previous descriptions. So here we have one of the definitive fluid males that's doing what's called a butterfly flight around the log. In just a second, we're going to have a female come in and land on the log. Right there. She is about that hard to see in real life. The male continues to do behaviors with this butterfly flight around her before he comes and lands on the log. This is a posture we call throat flag, so those throat feathers are actually erectile and we can stick them out. He's now flown up to above the canopy, so about 30 meters high, and he's doing circles up above the canopy, giving a high-pitched vocalization. The female stays on the log during this time. And then he dives back down through the canopy and makes a vocalization sound, and then there's a copulation in this case. So that vocal or that sound that you heard, <laughs> um, that vocalization that you heard is actually a combination of a vocal sound and a mechanical sound produced by the wings. So that was what I was expecting to see based on the literature, but what we also saw during this work was coordinated display between multiple males. So this is a multi-male display without a female present, 
Um, I don't have a video with the, with the females actually present, but you'll see coordination between the two different males' behavior. Um, as I will show you in a little bit, we also see this, these behaviors occur when a female is present. So again, you have two males on the display site coordinating behaviors in an area. This was not what we expected based on the literature, and this is what propelled me to ask questions about this species. So one of the first things I needed to do was I actually needed to describe the behaviors in this species because they hadn't fully been captured in the previous descriptions. So in order to uh, define cooperation in the species, as I started out with, I said that cooperation is these selfish replicators. This is a definition that is based on the lifetime fitness or reproductive success of an individual, and you have to be able to see these, this give and take of the reproductive success, or the, the you know, decrease in reproductive success for the beneficiary. So this is a great definition for understanding the whole theory of evolution and the theory of cooperation. However, it is not as functional in the description of long-lived species where we are describing behaviors based on what is seen in the field. So another definition that is frequently used for cooperative display coalitions, which are a specific type that, we're, that I'm specifically looking at, is any time when two or more males congregate and coordinate their behaviors to attract and mate with females. So in order to describe the cooperation in the species, I use that definition and then some other papers that have defined co cooperation in closely related species to come up with this checklist. Basically, are there multiple individuals involved? Is the behavior synchronized? Is it a display for conspecifics, whether that be females or males? Are there any unique behaviors that occur only when there are multiple individuals around or in the context of cooperation? Is it used to attract mates? And is it potentially obligatory for copulation to occur? So in order to address these questions and this describe cooperation in this species, I used mist nets to capture birds. This allowed us to put individual color bands on them so we could tell individuals apart. We basically took we also took basic morphological measurements and took a blood sample so I could look at relatedness between different individuals. The bulk of the data from this population came from observations. So I was able to do this over six different breeding seasons um, using some of the data originally collected on Dr. Alice Boyle's work in the altitudinal migration work. Um, we found 72 different display sites in total across the six years but on average, there were only 32 logs that were active in any given year. In total, we had 2,689 hours of observations from which I was able to pull data. And in total, we color banded more than 550 individuals. However, those individuals that showed up in the observations, we only had 221 males and only 34 females, even though we had roughly similar numbers of males and females banded. So looking at the cooperative display coalitions from the video that I showed you and from other work, yes, there are multiple individuals involved in this. There was synchronization between the behaviors both in time and in space. These displays were for conspecifics. Both males and females were present in these contexts. And we also found a unique behavior. So we termed this the partner pursuit. Uh, this is a behavior where two males are low to the ground following each other in the area of the log. They'll come back and perch right next to each other, start this up, vocalize during it. We saw no evidence of antagonistic behavior during these. Um, in the cases where we had a definitively plumaged male and a young male, that definitively plumage would both lead these and then follow at times as well. Um, and on average, we had 0.3 pursuits per hour. So this is a unique behavior that we found in this population, checking off that box as well. So a key one is, were these behaviors actually used to attract mates? So in the context of the, the solo displays and these multi-male displays, we found that there was no significant difference in the proportion of dis displays for females that end in a copulation. So females were watching these displays and they were copulating after the solo displays and the multi-male displays at approximately the same rate. As you can see, we see more solo male displays than we see multi-male displays, but the key part is that females are copulating after both types. So then, yes, they are used to attract mates, but we also see copulations after solo displays. 
So no, it is not obligatory for copulation. The, the cooperation is not obligatory for copulations to occur. Um, so the, the key one that I think here, based on the other definitions of cooperative display coalitions, is that yes, these displays are used in the context of attracting mates. So they are part of the, uh, the displays for females. So once I was able to establish that we do have this range of behaviors within the white earth mannequins, I was able to use this variation to ask a variety of questions. So we have single male sites and multi-male sites. And at each of those sites, we have a dominant male and we have solo males over here at the solo sites with subordinate males who are also at the multi-male sites. This allows me to ask questions to compare between solo males and dominant males to look at these different strategies and potential fitness consequences of the different strategies. So again, my overall research question is really to understand why do the dominant individuals cooperate? And I had several different hypothesized fitness consequences in this area. Um, so the very first one, what I want to talk about is indirect fitness. So indirect fitness might play a role here if the dominant individual is related to the beta individual or the secondary individual. <coughs> In addition, um, that secondary individual or subordinate individual would need to gain re future reproductive success through his interaction with the dominant individual at this point. However, the first step in that process is the two individuals would need to be closely related. The second fitness consequence would be immediate direct fitness. So you can think of this as annual reproductive success. So in other, con other species of cooperative breeders and those in cooperative display coalitions, it has been found in other species that helpers do help increase the number of offspring that are sired or fledged, like in that wild turkey example. Um, so here we might expect there to potentially be an increase if females are choosing groups that are males that are cooperative or some other way that there's actually an increase in, in the reproductive success or having a subordinate could potentially decrease the reproductive success and this would be a cost to cooperation for the dominant individual. Um, this could occur through sneaker copulations or um, other disruptions of copulations with females by the subordinate individual. There could also be a social status or, or tenure cost. So in a iteroparous species like this, where reproduction happens in different bouts across field seasons, or across breeding seasons, my field season, <laughs> um, uh, it's important not only that you have reproductive success in a given year and in a given breeding opportunity, but that you are surviving and that you also are maintaining your social status into the next year so that you can reproduce again in the future. So within wire off mannequins, only the dominant individuals are actually breeding. And so it's important that the dominant individuals maintain this hierarchy and stay at the top so that they're the ones copulating. So we could see this potentially having a, being cooperative could increase their social status if having a subordinate around maintains their position. So they could maintain this position potentially through some mechanism like scaring off or, or defending the area against conspecific male intruders or something else like that. Or having a subordinate around could also decrease one's fitness if they serve as a challenge and they knock the dominant individual out of the display site and off that hierarchy. Um, and support for this idea has been found in other cooperative species like lion groups where males will defend their area together and maintain the social hierarchy. And finally, similar to social status, like I said, you need to survive from one year to the next to be able to maintain your reproductive ability to reproduce in future years. So we could imagine a situation where having a subordinate around could increase your survival, such as vigilance for potential predators, some other context like that, or having a subordinate around could decrease one's own survival if there's competition for food or just extra energy main, uh, to maintain that social hierarchy. So I'm going to 
So the other thing I should mention is that all three of these are components of lifetime reproductive success and lifetime fitness for direct fitness for that individual. And what I'll be showing you for the rest of the talk is basically going through these different components and different hypothesized fitness consequences to and look at the results that I was able to find. So one of the important steps is first I need to define the dominant individuals. And so at each display site, the dominant individuals were defined as those individuals who a uh, bit of a, a ratio between the amount of uh, time spent there, the total time spent at a display site, the amount of time they spent alone without other males, and the amount of time they spent vocalizing when no other males were there. So at each display site, I was able to identify a dominant individual. And then I, was, I used a um, half-weight index or association index that basically shows how much time the dominant individual spends with other individuals divided by how much time a dominant individual or each of those individuals spend with any other individuals as well. Um, so what the, I defined an individual, a dominant individual is cooperative if basically greater than 27% of the time of their interactions or sessions. There are some slight differences in how this was calculated between years, which I can address in the questions if you're interested. Um, and I chose this cutoff because it was kind of a natural break in the, the behavior and the ratio for those, the association metric. Um, and it basically meant that a quarter of the time these males that were cooperative were spending, at least a quarter of the time were spending their time with other males. And annually, there are about 19 to 44% of the dominant males were classified as cooperative. So going into my different hypotheses, the first one about indirect fitness, that first step of it is that are these males closely related to each other? The way I was able to do this, I used 20, sorry, 12 different microsatellite loci that had already been, the primers had already been published, and I used those to look at the um, pairwise relatedness for these different individuals. So I didn't know, I didn't have a pedigree for my individuals and I used pairwise relatedness which ranges from negative one to one. Basically, are they highly related to each other or very distantly related to each other with zero being the random given the population. Um, and in order to do this, I compared the known male pairs that I had to, the ran to random pairs pulled from the entire population. So we're gonna look at a couple of graphs like this Basically what I did is I took all of the potential pairs from the population in any given year, so those males who are alive in a given year that I had genetic samples for, randomly drew 10,000 different samples of those pairs from that population, and that creates the gray background. The dotted lines are the 95% confidence intervals on that background population. The dark line is my, the mean of my known pairs, so males that we actually saw displaying together either for females or not for females, and the mean of that. If the mean is within the 95% confidence intervals, then they're not significantly different than the population mean. Um, and also, if they're higher than zero, then we'd expect them to be more related where, than the population mean, and if they're less than zero, then they are less related than the population mean. So my results, for the different years is I found that the, the partners are not close relatives. So in 2000, I'll talk about 2008 in a second, but 2010, 11, 12, and 13, we found that the population mean of the known pairs is not different from the overall uh, population based on the random pairing from that population. In 2008, there was a significant difference. It's outside those 95% confidence intervals. However, they are less related than the mean of the population in general. So even though it is significantly different from the population, it's actually not in the direction we would expect if indirect fitness was playing a key role in this population. So looking at my hypothesized fitness consequences, no, that first step of relatedness doesn't seem to be there for, the, for there to be any uh, fitness benefit through indirect fitness for the dominant individuals. Going on to the next three, hypotheses, I was particularly interested not just in the pattern of what was going on in the population, but also potential processes for how these are happening. So what are the mechanisms 
that would be underlying any patterns that we were seeing in the population. So in order to look at this, I used the behavioral observation data from the six years to look at what patterns we were actually seeing for these different uh, direct fitness benefits, survival differences, and social status differences in the population between the solo males and the multi-males. But I also designed experiments to look at potential underlying mechanisms that could explain any differences in the patterns that we saw. And I will go through all of those now. So first off, the idea of immediate direct fitness. So this is the annual reproductive success of an individual. So I was asking whether males who cooperate have higher annual reproductive success. One of the, the way that I measured reproductive success in this population was using a proxies of both copulations and the number of female visitation rates. I was unable to find nests for this species and therefore unable to look at actually genetic siring uh, success, um, which we can talk about in questions more if you have questions related to that. Um, it has been found in other papers that copulations and female visitation rates at lecking species are correlated with the actual genetic siring success. So they are proxies, but there has been support in other species that they're closely related. So first off for this one based, so the pattern here, uh, we found that there was no influence of cooperative status on our models, looking at whether there was differences between co the cooperative males and the solo males in their annual reproductive success, whether our response variable were the female visitations or were the copulation rates. So that was the, the pattern, but going on, I also wanted to look at the potential processes underlying it. So one potential mechanism for any differences would have been that potentially that males who are cooperating are able to detect females more quickly. In other species, it seems that there's a pattern where in the onset of display, faster onset of display of in, in bringing females to the display sites, there's more uh, reproductive success for those individuals. Um, so in order to test this, I used an experiment, and this is a similar experimental setup for the other three experiments that I'm going to talk about in a bit. Basically, if you have the display log here, we had two different kind of distances that we recorded measurements in. We did all our observations from the same blind locations that we did all of our behavioral observations. And in the center, right near the, the center of the display point, we put our stimuli, our stimulus. In this case, it was a female, a live female in a cage. The, all of these experiments were broken into a pre-trial period where the stimulus was covered or silent in the case of the vocalization one. And then at the middle point, we would uncover the stimulus using a string and then record the behaviors that occurred also during the trial period. So I was able to look for response actual behavioral responses in that in the differences between the pre-trial period and the trial period. We conducted this female detection experiment at, or I used 12 of the different display sites in the analysis that this was occurring at. In total, I collected 14 different variables, behavioral variables, but there were only six of them that showed any difference between the pre-trial and the trial period, showing that they were actually the male's responses to this caged female. These first five I were all highly correlated, so I used a principal components analysis to reduce them to just two components. This last variable, latency to respond, was one that the observers noted when they observed the first obvious response of the male to the stimulus in the center. And so this could have been uh, head tilting and the parent looking at the display or some other behavior that made it seem to the observer that they were separate. I did not include this, be this behavior response in the PCA with the other ones because in some ways it was an observer-based uh, mixing of all the different behavioral cues and there's also the potential that that one is a, an observer-based uh, response instead of the, the behavior specific played by the males. So here is a female actually in the cage. So here's the moss covered display log, the Kate wire cage with a female inside of it. During the pretrial period, this was covered with a brown cloth to camouflage it. Um, and 
What we found is that, again, there was no significant difference or that males did not respond more quickly to females if they were cooperative or if they're a solo site. So our first principal component you could kind of interpret as intensity of activity. Um, and we found no difference between the solo males and the cooperative males. Our second principal component, which you could interpret as the amount of activity away from that stimulus, though there is again no significant difference. And in our last one, this measure of latency for male response, we did find a significant difference. But if anything, the cooperative males were actually slower to respond. So let's use their latency measurements in seconds on the y-axis. The cooperative males were slower to respond than the non-cooperative males. So that would suggest that our initial hypothesis that there could be a, a benefit from cooperation for the dominant individuals if they're responding faster to the females does not seem to be there. If anything, it's a potential cost. So looking at the immediate, uh, immediate reproductive success, we did not find any benefits for dominant individuals based on that fitness consequence and potentially a cost in that in the process portion of it in that they're not responding faster. So going on to my third fitness consequence of do males who cooperate maintain social status longer than those that do not cooperate? Um, again, I was looking at all of the, the maintenance of social status across those six different years and differences between the solo males and the multi-males. And based on the, the, the pattern of cooperation or pattern of social status across all of the years, again, using a binomial GLMM, I found no difference in whether or not a male was maintained their social status in the next year based on whether or not they were cooperative in the previous year. So cooperative status did not contribute significantly to this model either. And that's the same for whether I did this when we had a minimum tenure estimate, meaning that we had the, they, we didn't exactly know their full length of tenure because they had the tenure in the first year or the last year of the study, or whether we reduced that just to the individuals that we knew their full tenure. Um, but again, I was also, I was interested in any potential pattern or processes underlying patterns that we saw. So I again conducted a very similar experiment, but this time it was to look to see whether cooperative males potentially were detecting conspecific males differently than the solo males were. So this was a playback experiment where we put speakers at the center of the log, camouflaged, and played during the pre-trial, 15 minutes of silence, and then during the trial, 15 minutes of uh, vocalization once every 30 seconds, which is similar to the natural pattern of vocalizations in the species. Um, here, again, we had five of the different behavioral uh, metri metrics that we were calculating that actually showed up as responses and difference between the free trial and trial. And the stimuli that I used, um, I used five different unknown males as the stimuli for the conspecific male. And then I used a control from Pipra Pipra, which is a related uh, mannequin species that's in the area, but should not be a competitor for display sites. The, the legs are in totally different areas. And so one of the first things I needed to do was test to see if there was a difference between their male's response to the conspecific and to the control. And there was a significant difference. And basically males, white rock mannequin males, are not responding to the uh, white collared mannequin display vocalization, but they are responding to other white rock mannequin displays or vocalizations. <coughs> so then I could look at the actual analysis of the difference between cooperative males and solo males in their response to the conspecific vocalization. And again, there was no difference or the, the whether or not a male was cooperative or solo did not significantly contribute to this model to explain the patterns that we saw in the, the data. So going back to my hypotheses, no, there does not seem to be any contribution of cooperative status to whether or not a male is maintaining their social status between different years. Finally, on to the last one, looking at survival. Um, so are males who cooperate, do they live longer and therefore potentially have access to more different 
breeding bouts and increasing lifetime reproductive success through living longer by having a subordinate individual around. And looking at the, the pattern that we saw across the six years, um, again, males who were cooperative in a given year were not more likely to survive to the next year um, based on whether they were cooperative or non-cooperative in a given year. <coughs> so um, again, this result doesn't really change whether or not we're looking at males who had a minimum age or we knew their exact age across the, the study. Um, but I was still very interested in what any potential patterns that could happen, or processes that could be underlying these patterns. And so, as I had mentioned in the, in the intro, one of the potential mechanisms for surviving longer if you have a subordinate individual would be the detection of predators. So vigilance is a uh, is something that has been hypothesized and supported actually for social organisms and the creation of social groups. So having another male around could potentially increase survival if you're able to detect and therefore respond to predators more, uh, more quickly or more intensely. So I did a similar experiment, but this time we used a model predator as our stimuli. There were two different behaviors that were responses. So again, that latency to respond variable and the number of times that was spent um, within this two meter circle. This was conducted using three different stimuli. So the initial one, Sustis, is a snake that's well known to be a predator for small birds um, and was to represent like a ground-based predator. The a raptor, so a barred forest falcon, which is a small avian predator, fast flying, that is also known to eat small birds in the size range. And then the final one was supposed to be a control. It's a lizard and a myba lizard, which is still a large lizard, so it had a visually similar impact as the snake and the falcon, but should not is not documented to be a predator on these types of birds, and therefore should not be perceived as a, a predator. Um, so one of the first things I needed to do was look to see if the the Mannequins are actually responding to these potential predators the way I'd expect. So we have our snake and our, our uh, avian predator, and then this is what an amoeba lizard looks like. I tried my hand at being an artist <laughs> and carving one out, and potentially my lizard model did not look as accurate as it could have, which may explain some of our results. <laughs> uh, I'll keep my day job. <laughs> Um, so when you look at latency to respond, uh, we see that there is no significant difference between the different um, uh, between the different models. So they are not responding differently to the falcon, the lizard, and the snake. So they may not be perceiving the falcon and the lizard actually as predators. Uh, when we look at the amount of time they spend within two meters. There actually is a significant difference between the falcon and between the lizard and the snake. And the males did not, none of the birds approached within two meters of the falcon model. Um, however, they did come within two meters of both the lizard and the snake model. So interestingly, this matches up what we would expect from the behavior based on these predators. So a fast flying uh, avian predator, usually we see the birds that are, the, the small prey birds leave areas when, when these predators are in the area and they're quiet and they basically just disappear, which is more or less what we saw when we were doing behavioral observations. Whereas with, with a snake predator, um, there is, uh, uh, in other species we see mobbing behavior, which we saw during the observations on these. And mobbing behavior has been found to be a deterrent for predators. So other species of, uh, here in the States, rattlesnakes actually will move away from their foraging spots after a defense display has been shown to them by ground squirrels or wood thrushes or other species like that. So doing a display around the predator seems to be an appropriate response for a snake. Um, so when we actually looked at the responses is there a difference between the cooperative males and the solo males and how they're responding to these uh, models? We found that for the 
uh, latency to respond or behavioral response. I was unable to fit a, a model to that, so I turned it into a binomial, yes, no, they responded. And there was a close but non-significant contribution of cooperative status to this model. So it does not seem that the males are not, are not necessarily responding more quickly to the, the model. But when we look about the amount of time of whether they came inside the two meters, we found that the overall, overall model is significant and that the cooperative status contributed significantly to um, whether or not they were coming within two meters. This I would explain because I did not measure whether or not this, this, the, the amount of time and then whether or not they came within two meters was a total amount based on all of the individuals that responded, not based on a per individual basis. So at a cooperative site where you have more individuals who actually are responding, you would expect that there would be a, a stronger response purely because of more individuals present. And so this is uh, based similar to what you would expect based on, on those. So when we look at our fitness hypothesis, my hypothesized fitness hypotheses again, um, we see with this final one that we did not see any difference in the pattern of survival across the years based on the behavioral observation data, but there did seem to be potentially some underlying survival difference or at least response to predator difference that could underlie a survival difference um, in, in this species. So, as I mentioned um, previously, the, there has been some evidence showing that these behavioral responses to predators are influencing predator behavior, snake behavior in particular, and potentially could underlie a, a survival response in a much longer term pattern. So I've gone through the different components, the makeup lifetime fitness here, and didn't find any difference. However, we can look at also at, at lifetime reproductive success across the, the six years of the study um, and look potentially to see if there's any difference between males who cooperate, is there a difference in their lifetime reproductive success? So one of the first things to potentially ask is across what we can call a, a lifetime, which is the six years of the study, is there any difference and what are the patterns of cooperation we see across years? So I had four, 33 different dominant males who held dominant status in at least two years. The rest of them are only dominant for a single year. Of those, 13 of them never cooperated, and seven of them cooperated in all of the years that they were dominant. There were 13 individuals that switched their cooperative status, which you can see here in this figure. So some of those males went from non-cooperative to cooperative. Some of them went from cooperative to being non-cooperative, and some of them switched back and forth, like this individual in black, who was not cooperative, cooperative, and then cooperative. So there seems to be no consistent pattern of cooperation across an individual's lifespan for those individuals that are switching. So it's not a situation where everyone starts out cooperative and then becomes non-cooperative once they're more established, or some other pattern such as that. Um, the other thing about this is that since there are males that are switching, when I talk about anything on a lifetime scale, I need to look at proportion of cooperation. I can't simply say they were cooperative or non-cooperative during their lifespan. So when we look at patterns of reproductive success, total reproductive success in female visits or in populations across males that were cooperative in multiple years, we see no pattern of or correlation between the proportion of their tenure that they were cooperative and their reproductive success. So one consideration caveat for this is that my study was six years long. We had at least one male, or we had one male, who was held dominant status for all of the years of the study. So it's very likely that many of the longer tenured and therefore also longer lived individuals, I'm not capturing in, in any of my research, and particularly not in these patterns of lifetime reproductive success. So um, when I, what I'm limiting everything to here are those individuals that we know their exact tenure, and so they were not present in the first year of their study, they were not present in the last year of the this, this study, so it means that in maximum, they could only be have a tenure for four years. So I'm excluding, in these results, the longest lived individuals, which are potentially biasing the results that we're seeing here. 
So overall, when I'm looking at patterns of any differences between cooperative males and solo males in this population, we don't find any support in any of the patterns. In the processes, we also find lack of support, but potentially in survival, with survival being there is some potential uh, predator-mediated response that's different between the, the cooperative behaviors and not. Um, and as I mentioned, other social species have found that predation and, and vigilance for predators seems to be an explanation for how sociality can develop. So in summary, I described that Corpiblotera, the white mannequin, has coordinated and cooperative displays. We also found that as measured, I found no fitness consequences of cooperation for the dominant males. Um, but there does seem to be an intensified predator response at cooperative sites, and that could have a survival effect that I didn't actually detect here because of some of those limitations of not capturing full lifespans for, certain, for the longer-lived individuals. Um, so thinking, stepping back a little bit and thinking bigger picture, what have I learned after eight years thinking about these questions? Actually longer since I thought about them before I started. Um, so cooperation uh, by dominant males does not seem to actually be driven by female mate choice. So this is something that, you know, coming in, I would have, I actually did immediately go towards female mate choice and thinking all of this is in context. Even in the way I define it and as a literature, we are defining cooperation in the display behavior is through this, you know, it's, it's used to attract mates and it's part of our definition. But potentially the actual, any benefits or costs associated with cooperation in these display, uh, cooperative display coalitions is not actually driven or mediated through female egg choice. It might have to do something with a, another aspect such as survival um, that is found in other types of sociality. Um, in addition, cooperation could also be maintained through benefits to subordinates. So I talked about at the very beginning kind of the two different perspectives of why are subordinate individuals cooperating, why help? There's a lot of great work done on that, but I was also particularly interested in this question of why do dominant individuals cooperate and focused on that. But potentially to understand cooperation in this, full, in this species, someone or future work needs to go back and look at why are the subordinate individuals actually cooperating potentially. That's where we might see some differences um, and how this behavior is maintained in the population. And then finally, it is also a possibility that cooperation could reflect some sort of selectively neutral sociality, and that's why we see no fitness consequences um, for this behavior in the population. So, like I said, I was particularly focusing here on the recipient's perspective, on that side of the equation, but we could learn more about, the by, about this species and about the evolution of cooperation um, by making sure that we pull in that other side too. Why are the helpers helping, um, which has not been addressed in this species at all. So with that, I would like to wrap up, and I want to thank all of the people who helped me, this does not include all of them, that helped me in this process. Um, so Emily has been an incredible advisor across the first few years. First she accepted me as someone who wanted to work in a totally separate population, separate from her really cool system, and supported me throughout doing that. Um, Alice Boyle is a collaborator who initially got me excited about this and has been a great mentor and collaborator throughout the whole process. My committee is here and has provided valuable feedback throughout the last few years. Um, and then the Duval Lab and other members of the graduate students here, it's been great to work with all of you and see your projects develop as well. Um, Kendrick is a friend who provided all the photos that I used, most of the photos I used here. My field assistants, I could not have completed 2,000 plus hours of observations without them. They were essential and kept me sane and safe in the field. Uh, Beth McDougal Shackleton provided some of the genetics data from 2008. Uh, and then the staff that I worked with in Costa Rica were incredibly important to getting this work done and permitted and providing you with food. <laughs> um, and then I also want to thank my family for the support that they've given me across all of this. So thank you. And with that, I will take questions. And for those of you listening online, um, I don't have a mechanism for live questions, but if you send me an email or Twitter or Facebook, however you're watching, I can answer those questions in the future. 
So, thank you. Yes, Carla. Um, for the switching between cooperative status and SNL, did you ever look um, within males if, like, in a year where he was cooperative, if he was less successful than a year where he was less cooperative, and looking at it that way instead of looking at proportion of cooperation? Yes, so, oh, did I do that? Um, so what I also did that's in the dissertation but I didn't present here for time is that I compared in a given year, I'm trying to think if I did it across years, in a given year, um, so even males who are cooperative still display by themselves sometimes and display with another male sometimes. So I did a comparison between whether or not those solo displays by a male to subscribe as cooperative versus whether his solo display or multi-male displays if there's a difference in the number of copulations after displays for females, and there was no significant difference. Um, so, any other questions? Yes. Um, I have two. First one is how inbred is the population of that in your markers? Um, I didn't specifically look at that. So I was just wondering then with your relatedness inferences, if the reference population is inbred, like if everybody's inbred, inbred. then you're not going to detect individuals that are more related than the reference. Mm -hmm. So they might be sharing a lot of alleles, but you won't detect it, and it still has a higher relatedness. Mm -hmm. So that is very much a possibility. However, based on the, the natural history in this population, I wouldn't expect the inbreeding to be a huge problem. Um, it is a you know, a fairly contiguous forest and the individuals are, so when we're there early in the season, we're still getting some of that upward uh, migration. We are actually capturing some individuals um, that, you know, seem to be breeding just a bit higher than we're, we're studying. And so there does seem to potentially be some mixing. Um, and females are traveling a long way to like I have very small evidence of this to, to actually visit other leks, and so females seem to be moving much farther than males are. Um, so there might there's probably some mixing and in, interbreeding between the geographic areas through the females. And the next question I was like from a phylogenetic perspective or a macroevolution perspective, how easy is it to lose cooperation if this is just selectively neutral? If it evolved in another species, this species is speciated and it just has it, but it's not under selection anymore. Yeah, so back to here on the phylogeny. So cooperation, highly cooperative species are up here in the Chirocephia mannequins. And then here, kind of similar clade is the Coropipal mannequin, um, Coropipal mannequins, where the I've now described cooperation. So it seems like the coordination is more common in this, uh, this clade here. So there is potentially a phylogenetic history of it. Um, there also seems to be in the in the pipera as well. My guess is that as more behavioral work is done on some of the other species, there may be some shifts in, in how we actually are classifying some of those other species as well. So as far as loss of cooperation, um, I, I I can't really make a, a statement on that, um, but there does seem to be some clustering of cooperation across the phylogeny. Why should we capture so few females? So I think so the it's the reobservations of the females, although recaptures of female rates are lower as well. And I think that that really has to do with the, the amount of movement that females are, are like doing. So in this species down in southern Costa Rica, but it's a fragmented landscape, there have been studies on the movements of females, and I forget the exact numbers but the females are moving significantly further than the males are moving. Um, and so our capture strategy was we had a set, of, a set area where we did our primary netting and captured most of the birds. Um, and there we had almost equal numbers of males and females captured, although the recapture rates for females were lower. We also did some specific targeted netting for males at sites, so we got the individuals we were watching. So that's one of the reasons that we have higher rates for males for both captures and recites, but that huge disparity in why we're not seeing females is not because of our capture effort. Um, I think it has to do with the female movement effort and they're just moving a lot more and then um, 
we see them fewer times. So I expected to have a lot more females that we were observing, and most of the females that came to the observations were unbanded. Does it make any difference that the male and female pairs of milk have long-term experience with each other? So for example, if you look at this in the other groups that have shown a lot more coordinated display, mm -hmm. is that common? Um, so in the other species, so in a lecking system, the males, the females might have multiple visits to females and therefore have more experience that way or have bred with them in past years. Um, and actually within the, uh, the Lansdale mannequins, there's patterns of females are choosing the same males that they mated with in multiple years. Um, so with this species, because we had so many unbanded individuals, I can't say exactly who the female identity is and therefore why, or if they were coming back and visiting multiple times or mating with the same male multiple times. Does that fully answer your question? Or is there another? Okay. I'm going to go back here first. Um, the um, coordinated flight mm -hmm. that you talked about, the yep. is, did you have any other observations about that? Or? Um, ideas of why they're doing that? Why they're doing that? I, I don't know. So we did also see aggressive pursuits that we titled that, that were much more directed, pointed, they kind of went from the ground up into the canopy, only a single male came back, who was usually the dominant male, when it could get color bands on it. Um, so it does seem to be different in, in, in that context. But I don't have really any specific, it could go into kind of maintenance of some of the dominance hierarchies. But again, we saw like the order switch sometimes, so it's not always the dominant male pursuing a subordinate male or something like that. Um, <clears throat> I could sure. I could continue yeah, to yeah. speculate, but I yeah. Yes. Um, my question is on the solo displaying males. Mm -hmm. um, so, were those strictly solo, even in practice displays, or were they ever um, cooperatively practicing? Um, so the passive the, impact on there. The cooperative display, the way I did that, included the the males, the displays when females were there, but also the displays when no females were there. Um, and so the you know less than twenty five percent of their time, but usually less than about like five to ten percent of the time, they were with no other adult male. Um, there are also groups of young males that move through, so those green footaged individuals that are moving around, and they seem to descend on any display log, no matter who or what category the, the cooperative males were in. Um, and the other thing is, when I was doing the observations, I didn't necessarily know whether or not they'd be categorized as cooperative or non-cooperative. Um, so, yeah, so I don't necessarily, my memories don't necessarily match up with the status. But the young males would definitely come around and the, the resident males would interact with those groups of young males as well. Well, I'm going to be talking to all three of you more lately. <laughs> so, <laughs> later. <laughs> all right, so let's go ahead. Um, so, for the detection hypotheses about detecting females and detecting predators, mm -hmm. do you think that, did you ever see the dominant males perhaps patrolling less if they were in a cooperative uh, partnership so that perhaps there's, there really was a difference in the ability to detect them, but it wasn't because, so like if the dominant male could leave for a while, the subordinate male could be there instead. Like, did you see some of that where the dominant male could basically be gone for a period of time, and that, so that could be why the times were similar between them, that they could be trading off patrolling? So that, was, that. that was definitely my idea for why there might be the, a difference. Either that there were more individuals in the area, or potentially that there's a trade-off with the subordinate individual could kind of check out the log, and the dominant individual could go off and forage more. So some of Alice's work has shown that the dominant males, I'm pretty sure, or else this is in the Kairosifi mannequins, <laughs> the, the dominant males are um, lower in body weight than males that are floating. They seem to be expending more energy during the breeding season than, than males who are not the, the primary display individuals. Um, so there may be a cost associated with, with being the, the like holding or the display site holding male. Um, but I don't have, I'm trying to think how I would ask that the question in my day. If the dominant male is um, present as often in a cooperative as male also. versus a solo male, perhaps. Because then that could explain why there wasn't a difference between mm -hmm. being able to check them if that male was leaving support. Yeah. 
The, the one potential problem with, with just physically asking that question based on the data is how, you know, there's a lot of times that I think the males are present um, that we're not fully seeing them. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to ask as well is how many times, was there a difference in how fast the males and females actually detected live females in the field? Um, the problem with asking that question is they almost always detected them before we did. <laughs> so I wasn't able to ask that question. Um, Hence was using the, the females. Do we have time for one more? Um, one last question. Okay. I'm not clear on whether the, the dominant male is the lack holding male. Yes. It's his log. Mm -hmm. So when I use sole and male. And so presumably it's his sole. territory mm -hmm. in that area. And these other males are coming and going. So we saw. We saw that at those sites there were consistent, at those sites that were cooperative, there were more consistent uh, secondary males that were showing up. It's not as tight a relationship between like alpha and beta as you see in some of the Chirocephia mannequins, there, which is why I tended to say more multi male. Um, but you do have consistent, at, at many of the logs, there are consistent males that show up as the subordinate ones. But you will also see them at other sites too. And is he always older than the subordinate ones? Um, I didn't find any cases where he was, where the subordinate one was older, but there were a lot of cases where they had the same minimum age, and I, I can't. Make Don't really that. know. Yeah. So in those there seems to be a seniority years. thing going on. If it takes them five years to get their adult plumage, mm -hmm. and then they maintain that plumage indefinitely after that, right? So I think there is, is definitely some level of that going on. And the other interesting thing about mannequins as a family is that. The, the number of years it takes to get their definitive plumage varies from species to species. So in the Chirocephia mannequins, it's five to six years, correct, in the long-tailed, depending on how you count it, four to five, depending on how you count. Where in the white rough mannequins, it's only three years. So they seem to be not as highly, like, as, as highly cooperative and as much coordination and um, more, here we have more individuals who are solo than cooperative, whereas in the Chirocephia mannequins, it's more individuals who are cooperative with relatively few that are not cooperative or in one of the species none maybe um and so it seems like the the more highly cooperative the longer that delay in plumage maturation it sort of sounds like if if you took away all the secondary males you'd still have the same population dynamics going on that these single males have territories and have logs and they have their females mm -hmm. And, and there's a certain amount of chasing around with some other males passing through the area. And that's that's one of the you know surprising conclusions to me is that it seems like this cooperation doesn't really seem to be influencing the female mate choice and you know explanations for it aren't within that realm of mate selection. Yeah. So with that, we'll wrap it up to leave lots of time for the committee, but thank you, Megan. Yeah, we're going to bring the one